Amen. Thank you, Jerry. Good morning, church. Good morning. It's good to see everyone today as we come uh, on this uh, Communion Sunday. We're going to do something very special today, and we're glad that you are here to join us. And it's good to see everybody, and it's good to see the harvest coming in, isn't it? It's just, I just love this time of year. It's just a beautiful time. But we're going to begin. We're going to teach you a new song today. You're going to learn it over the next month. Aren't you guys excited? It's one of my favorites. The first time I heard this song was at the Iowa Speedway in Chapel with the drivers. And it's like, oh man, this is an awesome song. It's called Mighty to Save. If you're able to stand and join us as we sing. <laughs> Thank you. 
Christ alone my hope is found. My hope is found. We don't want to get confused. So. We can do it without the first verse. We don't have it. The second verse is Christ alone who broke. Oh, this is a, this is that different song. I thought I should yeah. the word to this. Okay. Yeah. You're going to hear us sing this song again, all right? You guys are 
Okay, uh, children will this. Right, Larry? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, we have one. We're going to pass around a clipboard. This is for um, Phil and Pam Morgan concert next week. We need some goodies. So if we'd like to pass that around, sign up. And uh, volunteer. I'll walk you up there. Come on. No. She is. I wonder where she gets that from. <laughs> Come on up. <laughs> okay. Four little girls and medium-sized girls this morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> oh, they silenced them before they came up. Is that how this works? <laughs> okay. Well, it's good to see you on this beautiful, beautiful day. And thank you, Praise Team, for that, those songs. They were just, oh, wow, such an inspiration. Okay, well, I brought a couple things with me today. You'll probably know what they are. They're kind of alike and they're kind of different. I know, paper towel is really not, not part of it, but just to protect, okay. All right, so what's this? Glass. It's kind of like a window. It's just a piece of glass, right? It's kind of like where our windows are made of glass and we can see, what can you see when you look through a window? Yeah, whatever's on the other side, right? Yeah. Trees, if you're looking outside, you can see trees. Mm -hmm. All right, that's so that piece of glass. You can see through and see everything on the other side. All right, this is also a piece of glass, but it's a mirror. What can you see when you look in the mirror? Oh, yourself? You can't see me if you look in the mirror? Not really? Oh, but if you look just in the mirror, you can just see yourself, can't you? Do you girls look in the mirror every day? Maybe before you go to school or, yeah? Okay, well, the thing about, so they're the same because they're both made of glass, right? But they're different because you can't see through a mirror, can you? You can just see yourself when you look in the mirror, pretty much. So that's kind of like Christians can be. We can be a Christian that just sees ourselves, just thinks of ourselves. We don't think about anybody else. It's all about us. Or we can be the kind of Christian, like a window that can see everybody else. You can see maybe what they want or they need. Or maybe there's somebody on the playground, you know, that maybe doesn't have anybody to play with. You could be the kind of Christian. You could be the kind of person that says, hey, do you want to play with us? So that's kind of looking out for others. You can see other people and other things that they might need, okay? So let's be, do you think God wants us to be a mirror Christian or a window Christian? What do you think? Do you think he wants us just to see ourselves and think about ourselves? No, he wants us to think about other people too. You know, a long time ago, I, I learned a little song and it says, it's mine, but you can have some. With you, I'd like to share it. Because if I share it with you, you'll have some too. So that's kind of how we want to go through life. We want to be sharing what we have. We want to think about other people and not just about ourselves. Like when we look in the mirror, we can just see ourselves. Let's think about other people too, okay? Because that's what God would want us to do. All right, let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for this time together here. And thank you for this beautiful day. Thank you for these children that are here and their families. I ask that you bless them. And I ask that you help us all to be more like window Christians where we can look and see what other people need rather than just seeing and thinking about ourselves. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. that they'd like to share with the congregation this morning or praises.
certainly want to remember people affected by the hurricane and uh, all throughout that area over there. A lot of devastation that we see. Uh, want to certainly keep our world, so much tension in our world today. We want to pray for peace, and we know that will truly come when Jesus comes again, the Prince of Peace. But we can pray for peace. Any others that we might mention? Yes, Betty. Okay, Samaritan's Purse is a part of the... Okay, Samaritan's Purse is helping with the flood of victims. Okay, great prayers for those people. Yeah. Any others? Okay, our hymn of prayer this morning is... Um, where are we at? The Old Rugged Cross. The Old Rugged Cross. I'm just, okay, well, the Old Rugged Cross. Let's, if you're able to stand, if you'd stand, let's sing The Old Rugged Cross, 186. <laughs>
Lord, the old rugged cross, where your son died for us. It wasn't shiny, it wasn't polished, it wasn't a beautiful thing that we see so many people wearing today. I know there's probably people today who wear a cross. And God, we look in the world today and we even see people who don't know you. We have no idea what the cross truly means. And yet they wear it around their necks and as jewelry or a tattoo. And I feel bad for them, Lord, for they don't know the true meaning of what the cross represents. The self-sacrifice of your son, your love for us. But even more than that, that we as your people, the sins that we struggle with all the time, the Bible says was nailed to the cross. And it wasn't shiny. It was a blood stain with the precious blood of your son. And because of him and what he did for us, we come to you and we can just share our hearts because he is a mediator between us and you. And we're grateful for that. Lord, we know that he is a savior, the savior of the world. And we pray, Lord, that those who don't know you will come because he's mighty to save. He's mighty. Lord, as your people today, we pray because your son told us to pray. We come to you with what's on our hearts and in our minds. We pray for those certainly who are affected and those who are helping so many places, like Christian places like Samaritan's Purse that was mentioned. We're grateful for the aid that is going there. But it's a long recovery and we know that it's difficult those people. We look at our torn world today, not only by war, but in politics and in opinions and all sorts of things. And Lord, you came to unite us through your son. So Lord, we're grateful for this time that we can come and we can come before your throne and know that you heard our prayers this morning. We love you, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we're going to talk about something that is very dear to my heart today. And uh, I want to read the scripture that's in your, in your bulletin if you want to follow along. I might add a couple at the end. But uh, this is from 1 Corinthians 11. The Apostle Paul writes this to a church that really, can I say it, screwed up communion? And they did it right. I mean, this is in within, you know, Paul was a contemporary of Jesus, and this is pretty quickly after Jesus gave them the Lord's Supper. And already they were doing it incorrectly and with wrong motives. And Paul goes through that, and we're going to talk about that a little bit, but this is what Paul says to the people when he finishes kind of chastising them, and I'm going to read some of that later in the sermon. He says this, For I received of the Lord what I also pass on to you. The Lord Jesus, the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this. Whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. His father was a minister in what was known as the Old Light Anti-Burger Cedar Presbyterian Church. Not to be confused with the Old Light Burger Cedar Presbyterian Church, we're talking anti-burger. 
It was a time in history when churches were so divided that they had all these names added to their church. And that was back then in 1809 when Alexander was a student at the University of Glasgow in Scotland. The Cedar Presbyterian Church in Glasgow had certain requirements before a person could come to communion, to the table and partake of the bread in the cup. You would go before, the day before communion or a couple days before communion, and you'd stand before the elders of the church and they would examine you. And if they thought that you were worthy enough, you would be granted to partake of the Lord's Supper the following day or so. And they only had the Lord's Supper twice a year. So it was a very important time in the church's life. And if you, all, if you were deemed worthy enough, before you left, after your examination, the elders would hand you a token. And you were to bring that token to church with you. And when you walked forward for communion, that was a token to show everyone that you were worthy to partake of the Lord's Supper. But you have to remember that there were most likely people in the congregation who failed the test. So they would sit in the church pew while others would walk forward worthy, and they would feel so unworthy. Well, Aunt Alexander certainly passed that test, and it was given his token. But on that particular day in 1809, the hour of communion had come during the worship service, and Alexander sat in his pew, and he looked at those who could not go forward those who were unworthy. And he knew that he had to do something, so as his time came to walk up to the table, he slowly walked up to the table and threw his token into the plate before the elders and walked out without even partaking of the Lord's Supper. Now that might seem like a small matter to a lot of people, but it marked the day when Alexander Campbell determined that he would leave the Presbyterian Church and simply follow the Bible and have open communion for people, all believers. You know, to many church historians, Alexander Campbell was the influential leader in what is known today, the Christian churches and the churches of Christ. Have you heard of that? Well, if you've been around me, you have, because that's how I grew up. Honestly, I was thinking about this. This is the first non-Christian Church of Christ group I've been a member of. Thank you for welcoming me. <laughs> but it's like, I just, you know, this is my whole life. I've been that way. And as a result, you know, um, uh, communion is so important to me because they, we had communion every Sunday. And I'm not saying that, you know, one way is right or the other, but that was our tradition. Now, do you know, well, you people that were at Family Night know this. But you, do you know the reason why we do it four times a year? Now, family members, you can't say, right? Because Calvin, John Calvin had, did practice communion every Sunday, but the mayor of the town told them that they could only do it four times a year. So they started doing it four times a year, and they never changed. Isn't that interesting? Petrie told me that, so it has to be true, right? <laughs> All right, but I'm not saying one way is right or another. Churches do it all different ways, some monthly, some weekly, and some quarterly, whatever. So the early church practiced weekly communion. The Bible says in, the, in Acts chapter 20, verse 7, they met together on the first day of the week to break bread. But they did it different than we do. You know, we kind of have this nice little setup up here. But they had their worship service. It was kind of patterned after the Jewish worship that had reading the scripture, prophesying, preaching, praying, maybe a hymn or so. However, they did not have communion during this time. It was not a part of their, their order of worship. You know, after church service, every Sunday, they had what was called a love meal, an agape meal. And it was during the time they were out there, wherever they were, around this love meal, sitting around tables, that they had the Lord's Supper. So it'd be kind of like us. We have a potluck today. Instead of doing this here, we go and we sit around the tables out there during our potluck, and at some time, we stop and we do communion together, hopefully before dessert, right? But we do communion together. So they are way different. But, however, the church in Corinth had abused it. And, and Paul lays into them. Look at this. This is from the Message Bible. He says, regarding the next item, it's funny, the first part of this chapter, he says, I praise you for this. And now he goes, 
wait a minute, <laughs> don't get too big of heads. Regarding the next item, I am not at all pleased. I'm getting the picture that when you meet together, it brings out your worst instead of your best. First, I get reports on your divisiveness, competing and criticizing each other. I'm reluctant to believe it, but there it is. The best that can be said for it is that the testing process will bring truth into the open and confirm it. He goes on, and then I find that you bring your divisions to worship. You come together, and instead of eating the Lord's Supper, you bring a lot of food from the outside and make pigs of yourself. Maybe we ought to cancel the potluck, huh? No, we aren't going to do that. Okay, and make pigs of yourselves. Some are left out, out. some go home hungry. <laughs> Others have to be carried out too drunk to walk. I can't believe it. Paul said that. How would you like to be there? I go, wow. He goes on. Don't you have your own home to eat and drink in? Why would you stoop to desecrating God's church? Why would you actually shame God's poor? I would have never believed you would stoop to this, and I'm not going to stand by and say nothing. That's in the Bible, folks. It's supposed to be a love meal. Is anything but a love meal. How do I apply that today? If I come here to the Lord's table with our divisive heart, if I come to here at the Lord's table selfishly, with a selfish spirit, I not only diminish this service, but according to 1 Corinthians 11 that we read a little bit ago, I can become guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of Jesus. That kind's of, kind of serious, isn't it? If I allow any prejudice, social, racial, generational culture, to control my attitude to anyone else who will come to this table with me, I undermine the integrity of this meal. This meal is for all who believe. This meal was where we celebrate the death of Jesus for what? The whole world. So I need to be sure or certain and when I pick up that little piece of bread and I drink that little bit of juice, then I understand this is a love meal and what it's about. So that means that if we're not careful, we can miss the opportunity of communing not only with one another, but communing with our Lord, Jesus. In our scripture, Paul says, you're doing it wrong. But then he goes to that part that I read. For I received of the Lord that which also I delivered to you, that on the night in which Jesus was betrayed. So Paul says, listen carefully. This isn't what I said. This is what Jesus told me. So the church in Corinth needed to rewind, go back to the very basics of the bread and of the, and the cup, and figure it out. So let's look at the bread this morning. Let's look at the cup. Okay? The bread. So we take bread in our hands and we hold it. We touch it. We taste it. It's so small, isn't it? But it carries a lot of weight. It's a symbol, we know, of the broken body of Jesus. His body was perfect. It was the only body that never sinned. And it was ripped open. In, an early, in the early church and in many churches today, the bread that is used is unleavened bread. And I want to explain why some churches use it. When Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, it was on the night before he was betrayed, and it was Passover. And in the Passover feast, there would have been unleavened bread. Because when the Jewish people went from, left Egypt, Israelites fled Egypt, the bread was not raised and it was not able to rise so they were eating unleavened bread. But I think there's another reason, maybe a better reason, because Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, and 8 about you and me and how yeast affects our bodies. Listen to this. Get rid of the old yeast that you may be a new batch without yeast, for Christ the Passover lamb has been sacrificed. You see, in the early church, yeast represented how sin will infiltrate our bodies and just go all over. Just like if you put yeast into a, a, a cake or something, it affects the whole cake. 
One day, Ramona decided to make muffins, right? And baking powder yeast, is that what it is? It It is, but it causes it to rise, so she forgot the baking powder. So we had, uh, what do they call those? Cones instead of muffins. But anyway, (laughs) that has nothing to do with this. All right. So unleavened bread would be pure bread without yeast. And because of what Jesus has done to us, we come here pure. We come here pure. And because of God's grace and because of the cross, his body was broken and the bread was broken. And and the bread reminds us the nourishment. We know those scriptures. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. If you eat this bread, you will never go hungry again. He's not talking about physical bread. He's talking about him. If you partake of me. You know, I know, I don't know about you, but you can tell not too long after I eat, I'm hungry again, mainly after ch- Chinese food, right? Jesus said, if you come to me, if you come to me, I'm going to satisfy you. Finally, bread is a picture of unity that we have one with another. The unity in the body of Christ is like no other, okay? No other. 1 Corinthians 10, 16, and 17. He says, Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks, what? A participation in the blood of Christ. Is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? So when we take that, we are participating in, in Christ. Then he goes this. Because there is one loaf that we begin with, we who are many are one body. Isn't that cool? For we all partake of one loaf. So I don't know who prepared the bread, but often it's one loaf and you cut it up and it's one loaf, but we all partake of the one loaf. And that makes us one body. That's cool. The common spiritual identity we have in the bread. We're equal. We're equal as we taste. And there's no isolation. There's no room for rugged individualism. We are placed in the body of Christ, the church, and we're part of one another. The bread. How cool is that? And you know what? Today you get to do that. The cup. The second visual. It's a symbol of the blood of Jesus. We know that. And we know the blood, what the blood does. We sing songs about it. You notice I always pick out songs to try to go with my sermon. We sing a lot about that. Jerry played a great prelude, too. It says in 1 in Ephesians 7 and 8, in him we have redemption through what? His blood, the forgiveness of sins. How? According to the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding. God knew what he was doing when he did this for us. And the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. And I know preachers who discount the blood of Jesus. I had heard a preacher one time in a preacher's meeting say, Don't give me a bloody Jesus. What? How do you avoid that? Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. And when Jesus took the cup, he said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. And in the Old Testament, the main covenants were always sealed with the shedding of blood, an animal sacrifice. God sealed it. And God would never break a covenant with God, with man. And that's our covenant with God and God's covenant with us. So there's some things we can remember when we take the bread and we take the cup. We remember the past that Jesus died on the cross for each one of us. For God so loved the world. We remember the present because today we'll come to the communion in, pres- in, our, in the present time and we will take at the body of Christ. And that Jesus communes with us right now. Remember the, the future because Jesus said, for I will take, for, for I will, how does he say that? He says, um, you're partaking of the Lord's Supper until I come again. Just keep doing it. Don't quit. Don't quit. But I want you to know communion is a lot more than just remembering Jesus' death. It's a lot more than focusing on our sins forgiveness. I believe communion is about intimacy with Jesus. It's a main point whenever you do it. Is God taking the initiative saying, Mark, will you come to my table today? Will you fellowship with me? It's about clearing out all of those barriers that I hold between me and God and come 
We used to sing a song. I looked, it's not in our hymn book. Nothing between my soul and my Savior. Anyone know that song? Betty does. Of course Betty knows that song. Not of this world's a delusive dream. I have renounced all sinful pleasures. Jesus is mine. There's nothing between. Nothing between my soul and my Savior, so that his blessed face may be seen. Nothing prevented the least of his favor. Keep the way clear. There's nothing between. That's what the cross did. And when I read my Bible, I think of all kinds of people that Jesus had an initiative with, that he took initiative with, so that there's nothing between them. Rich folks, poor folks, immoral folks, Samaritan-type people, short guys, Zacchaeus, tax collectors, prostitutes, rulers, fishermen. He broke that barrier. And if he can do that with those people in the New Testament, he can do it with us. Let me tell you this. God never disappoints anyone seeking intimacy with him. Other people will, but God never disappoints anyone seeking intimacy with him. God doesn't say to you, hey, you know, maybe if you get on a scale of 8 to 10, I'll, I'll come down, I'll meet you. No, uh-uh. God doesn't do that. He meets you where you are, and he wants to know whether or not you have a desire to connect with him. Draw near to God, the Bible says, and he will draw near to you. You see, communion to me is God pursuing intimacy with me. Question today for you. Is God saying to you it's been a while since we've had this time together? Please don't push him away because you can come today. You might say, well, I sinned. I don't deserve intimacy with God, but nobody does. You know, Mark Young doesn't deserve to be here. Crystal Brainer, a great saint of our church, been here forever. She doesn't deserve to come to this table. Nikki Jass back there, she doesn't deserve to come. No one deserves to come. But that, the cross, the cross smashed your unworthiness so that you are not only worthy to come with no token, through Jesus Christ, who surrendered his life so that you can come today into his presence and have an intimacy that nobody else can offer you to come and have relationship with your personal God. And he pursues you to come. He wants you to come to the table. Humbly, I come. We're going to sing our song, and it's not a responsive song. I, I changed it to like a communion song. Because it is a responsive song, isn't it? This morning, we have the joy of breaking bread together. We have the joy of partaking of the cup together as a body of Christ. Let's sing, let us break bread together on our knees. If you're able to stand, please.
This morning as we partake, uh, I just pray that something I said today will make you draw a little closer to this time. That we will truly remember what a wonderful gift we have that we have been invited to the table. It's not my invitation. It's not Emmanuel Reform's invitation. It is the Lord's invitation. And he invites you to partake. So this morning I'm going to say a word for the bread and then we'll have the elders pass it out and then we'll partake the bread together. Let's pray. To you, God, we give praise for the body of Jesus. I know this body of mine, I just sin all the time. And he was a perfect sacrificial lamb. Without spot, without blemish. And he is willing to break it. And not not only was his body broken, but the Bible says he took all of our sins and they were placed on his body so that he could die for our sins. I can't imagine, Lord, going from being perfect to taking the sins of the world. But that's what your son did when his body was broken. So, Lord, we come today to partake bread. And he gave it to his disciples, and he said, Take eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Look at that bread. Taste it. The second symbol that you are going to hold in your hands today is representing his blood, his precious blood. It's on that cross he shed his blood. I love the old rugged cross, don't you? One of my favorite lines is, you know, so I'll cherish the old rugged cross, and and one day I'll lay down all my trophies, all my 
things that I think are important, and I'll cling to the old rugged cross. Jesus gave his life and shed his blood for you and me. Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, the perfect sacrifice, the perfect blood that was shed for us. We can't imagine what it was like for you to, to see your son giving his life in that way. But he did. It was all part of your plan that started way back when man sinned in the Garden of Eden. And you knew that without the shedding of blood, there could be no forgiveness of our sin. We thank you for the precious blood of your son. Not that what we take today is blood, but you told us to use this juice, this wine, to remember you by and remember your sacrifice. Now it is what we do together today as a body of Christ. that represents what Jesus did for you. It's a privilege to do what he asked us to do. He said to take the cup. So Jesus continued with the meal and he said, you know, whenever you take this cup, you will proclaim the Lord. But this is the cup which I shed for you. Drink this as often as you remember me. For as often as you drink this cup and you eat this bread, you will proclaim the Lord's death. You'll proclaim it, his death, until he comes. You may take the cup. Thank you for the opportunity to allow me to share communion with you and allow me to share with you my passion for this meal. It's better than anything Ramona ever made for me. I know I said that humorously, but it is the meal that we as a body of Christ truly love. Amen? Amen. Amen. At this time, we will receive our morning offering.
Let us pray. Lord God, you gave your best in your son. And we celebrated that today in a very, very special way that we certainly do not take lightly. So it's a precious time at your table. Lord, now may we give our best to you. We can offer our life in a sacrificial way, but we can offer our life to serve you. And we can offer our gifts to support the work of this church and beyond our walls in the kingdom work. So bless the gift and the giver. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You're all invited for to stay for the, the potluck that we will be have following the church. And as you realize, today is supposed to be, or is, Pastor Appreciation Day. And it, we are not only appreciating Pastor Mark, but also Lee. And I would ask if you both would uh, go to the back of the church after we get done. We would, uh, we would all like to, I think, greet you and thank you. Uh, it's just amazing with uh, the way the two have been working this summer and that Lee is going to be kind of uh, taking over now that somebody thinks they got to head south. Uh, it, it's, just, it, it's just the way I feel. It's, just, uh, it's so much neater when we have some continuity between the people that are speaking rather than having a different person in here each week. So I would like to thank both of them personally. And I would also, after we get done with the closing hymn, if you would just sit down, I have just a little bit that I would like to talk to you about the church. And uh, so after our closing hymn, if you would just be seated, that would be great. Thank you. We only have Oregon over here next Sunday. At 4 o'clock, Phil and Pam Morgan. So come, invite your friends. They're wonderful. They've been here before, but they're, they're really good friends of mine. So I was thinking about what to share for as we leave here. And I think communion, one of the things that it reminds me of is if God can love that much, I can love, right? And how am I to do that when I leave this place today? Well, a few chapters after Paul writes about communion, this is what he says about love. And I need to be this way. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. 
It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Leave this morning with love on your heart. And then anywhere with Jesus, you can safely go. Thank you.